Hi, I'm Sui. Today I'm going to explain to you in greater depth the vestibular system. If you have not watched my earlier presentation, which provides an overview on sensory integration, please watch that first. It will help you contextualize what I'm going to talk about here. The vestibular system is a fascinating topic to talk about. It is such a complex system that it is very hard to make this presentation simple and clear and yet fully explain its function. Nevertheless, I'll try my best. So these are the objectives for today's sharing. To have an overview of the vestibular system, to understand the function of the vestibular system, to identify signs and symptoms a child with vestibular processing difficulties might experience. When the vestibular system is functioning effectively, the pool of gravity generates a constant sensory flow from early fetal life until the point of death. The system can detect the slightest change in head movement and integrate this signal with the tactile and proprioceptive input to let us know where we are in space and how fast and in which direction we are moving. The vestibular nuclei starts to function about nine weeks after conception and by the fifth month, it is already well developed and able to produce adaptive responses to movement of the mother's body. These vestibular activities provide the foundation for the later development of vision and hearing. The receptors for the vestibular input are in the inner ear. There are two types of receptors. The first type is found inside the sacu and the utricle. This receptor responds to the force of gravity and detect the head movement as a result in change of pull of gravity upon the receptors. The second type is found in the semicircular canals. These canals are filled with fluid and the movement of the fluid as a result of head movement stimulate the receptors. This input helps us detect the change in the speed or direction of the movement. The combined input from both types of receptors are very precise and tells us exactly where we are in space and how we are moving. Sensations received by these receptors are sent mainly to the vestibular nuclei and the cerebellum. From there, they are then sent down both the spinal cord and into the brainstem, where they serve a powerful integrating role. From the brainstem, some of the information are sent to the cerebral cortex and integrate with the tactile, proprioceptive, visual, and auditory input to give us perception of space and our orientation within that space. Meanwhile, sensations that are sent directly down the spinal cord interacts with other sensory and motor inputs to help us with our balance, posture, and movement. We are usually not aware of the vestibular input unless the input is very intense, such as when we spin ourselves in circles and we will feel dizzy. The vestibular input is the most basic sense and has network flowings to all parts of the brain. Thus, it has influence in many functions. Together with the eye and neck muscles, it plays an important role in ocular motor control, which is our ability to track objects. It exerts a great influence on our muscle tone, which in turn affects our ability to hold position and our activity tolerance. Another important function of the vestibular system is that it helps us maintain balance. It also influences postural background movement, which are automatic adjustment of the body when we reach for something or push-pull with our hands. The vestibular system also feeds many inputs into the reticular arousal system at the brainstem. And this system helps to regulate our alertness levels. Well-modulated vestibular activity is very important for maintaining a calm and alert state. Less is known about how vestibular affect auditory processing in the cerebral cortex. However, 
it is known that vestibular activity is important for auditory processing in the brainstem. The two systems evolve together in the bones of the inner ear and travel together in a single nerve to the brainstem. Thus, during therapy session, we often notice that children with speech delay start to vocalize or talk more after engaging in movement activities. Vestibular information is processed together with proprioceptive and visual input at the cerebral cortex to give us spatial awareness. Spatial awareness helps us navigate around our physical environment and enable us to produce letter with consistent size and spacing. And lastly, the vestibular input also has a significant influence on our emotions. As mentioned before, the vestibular input gives us gravitational security, and this trust is the foundation on which we build our interpersonal relationship. Experiments have shown that without vestibular stimulation during infancy, animals often grow up to be hostile, aggressive, or withdrawn. There are two main things that might go wrong with the vestibular system. The system might under-respond or over-respond to vestibular inputs. Thus, when the vestibular input is not perceived accurately, neither the vestibular input nor the input from other senses can be used easily to produce adaptive response. So let us first look at under-responsive vestibular system. An under-responsive vestibular system produces a vestibular-based bilateral integration problem. The symptoms of this disorder are very subtle. Children with this problem usually have average or above average IQ. Their problems are often not detected until they enter primary school and have problems with reading, writing, and mathematics. And they usually do not improve with traditional educational support such as tutoring. Children with vestibular-based bilateral integration disorder face problems in three main areas. Eye muscle and posture response, bilateral integration and sequencing, and vestibular language disorder. Children with inefficient vestibular processing abilities have poor ocular motor control. Thus, they usually have difficulty reading, often skipping words or lines. They also tend to have poor ball skills and can find it a challenge to cross the road safely as they can't keep their eyes fixed on the moving traffic while walking at the same time. They might also experience low muscle tone, Low-tone children have difficulties in maintaining the upright position and get tired easily. When they are at their desk, they often slouch and will prop their heads up with their hands. They can also appear clumsy and have difficulty maintaining their balance on uneven surfaces, for example, when walking along a curb. Due to difficulties in partial background movement, they often appear stiff when they are writing at their desk. And when they do shift to adjust their body, they sometimes fall out of the chair. An easy way to assess these children is to get them to lie on the tummy and raise both the hands and legs up. Children with vestibular-based bilateral integration disorder cannot hold this position for more than a few seconds. With an under-responsive system, these children seek up intense movement input. They often do not get dizzy or nauseous after spinning themselves and love intense movement, such as being on a roller coaster. And as the name of the disorder suggests, these children often have poor bilateral coordination and sequencing abilities. Bilateral coordination is the coordination of two sides of the body. And sequencing here, refers to the ability to execute sequential movement, such as when doing jumping jacks or skipping rope in a smooth, rhythmic way. Thus, they might have trouble with dancing or playing musical instruments, such as drums. This is because their hands and feet do not work well together and they are unable to follow the rhythm. They are also often confused with direction, not knowing right from left. 
It is also often that brain specialization is affected. These children may be late in establishing hand dominance or might be ambidextrous. Due to the lack in brain specialization, speech development may be delayed too. With regard to social emotion, these children often do not feel confident and do not perform well in games or sports compared to their peers. And some might even seek approval from their friends by being the class clown, for instance, by falling down to amuse other children. On the other hand, children who over-respond to vestibular input tends to experience either gravitational insecurity or intolerance of movement. On the topic of gravitational insecurity, the disorder seems to be a result of poor modulation from the gravity receptors. And therefore, any change in head or body position may result in the child feeling uncomfortable. With regards to the intolerance of movement, the problem seems to lie more in the semicircular canal and that movement causes discomfort. Children with gravitational insecurity have an excessive fear towards change in head position and an irrational fear of falling. Their balance and coordination are usually better than those with an under-responsive vestibular system. And they usually have no problem with academic work as well, unless they have other neurological problems. However, they often feel anxiety when they are in a position they are not used to, or when somebody tries to control their movement by holding and moving them. Holding the head upside down gives the greatest stimulation, and thus, these positions are the most threatening to them. They would try their best to avoid doing somersaults or any kind of roughhousing. They are usually reluctant to try playground equipment such as swing or the wobble bridge. In extreme cases, they might not even allow people to stand near them while they are doing tasks. This is because they fear that others might move them by surprise. At the playground or play gym, children with gravitational insecurity often prefer to be alone at a corner and watch others play. They go to great length to avoid falling, although they seldom fall. This is in direct contrast to children with vestibular-based bilateral integration disorder, who usually have poor safety awareness, fall frequently, and typically show no emotional response. It is important to note that the fear that gravitational insecure children experience is a primal threat and is not rational. It does not do any good to encourage these children with rewards or try to rationalize the situation with them. In fact, this will only make them feel unhurt and more miserable. To reduce the fear, they might try to control the environment or people, making them seem stubborn and uncooperative. Children with intolerance to movement experience distress with rapid movement or spinning. They do not experience excessive fear like the gravitational insecure children, but they may face discomfort with movement and experience car sickness easily. So I hope you have a better understanding of the vestibular system and the signs and symptoms you might observe if a child has vestibular processing issues. These are the references that I have used for this presentation. For parents, I'll recommend the first book. For therapists, I'll recommend all three books listed here. So once again, thank you for listening to my sharing. The purpose of my sharing is to help you have a better understanding of sensory integration and the type of home strategies to implement. But you will still need an occupational therapy with experience in sensory integration therapy to do an assessment for your child. So do consult an occupational therapist if you suspect your child has sensory processing issues. So once again, thank you for listening to my sharing. In my next sharing, I will present to you what are some of the simple home strategies you can use to help children with vestibular processing disorder. Thank you. And I hope that you have a nice day.